So, okay, you're on. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am the Sam Yamov, uh, 2020 uh, medical graduate from Saudi Arabia. It is a tremendous pleasure for me to present today's topic, which is neuropathic pain. Uh, so we'll be talking about the definition of neuropathic pain and go through the pathophysiology and which conditions involve neuropathic pain or we can say the causes of neuropathic pain. And then we will proceed to how to diagnose someone with neuropathic pain. And finally, we will focus on treatment uh, whether by medication or interventions or pharmacologic uh, therapies. We will talk briefly as well on prevention. So what is neuropathic pain? It is pain that is caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system. So the whole nervous system, somatosensory nervous system, which includes peripheral nerves, goes to the spinal cord and its lung tracts, up to the thalamus and the cerebral cortex. Any lesion uh, along all uh, this way can cause neuropathic pain. So what is the pathophysiology? What happens on the microscopic level? You see, neuron injury leads to several things, and they include ectopic discharges, which means that neurons can fire uh, independently and produce discharges that uh, can be propagated to other neurons, including normal ones. And uh, injured neurons tend to have more uh, sodium and calcium channels, which leads to more excitability and neurotransmitter uh, release. They are also hypersensitive to inflammatory mediators like TNF and interleukins. There is also a central sensitization. So the central nervous system becomes more sensitive to pain. Uh, the central nervous system, of course, includes the brain as well as the spinal cord, which is important in a neuromodulation of pain. And of course, the central nervous system injury by itself causes disruption of the modulation of pain. So let's take a quick look on uh, the mo normal modulation of pain versus what happens in neuropathy. So this is a, uh, the pointer. This is the normal pathway in the periphery, periphery, you see? So for example, we have an organ like the skin and we have a fibers, A delta or A beta, which are myelinated, those uh, relay since other sensations that are than pain. But we also have C fibers, which are slow transmitting, which transmit the pain. Okay, and also we have this green nerve, which is descending, which modulates the pain. This is the central nervous system pathway. And we have other types of neurons. We'll go through them uh, briefly. So this is the uh, normal circuit. In nerve damage, we see here this uh, A fiber is damaged. Damage here produces um, or stimulates the expression of some channels on C fibers. These channels uh, include the sodium channels, see here, also some other channels like adrenergic channels, alpha adrenal receptor, for example, and the TRPV1 receptor, which is a receptor that responds to capsaicin uh, that's found in some spices. So the C fiber becomes more excitable, it has more channels. Okay, let's go. Uh, to here. Here is a, a damaged uh, circuit, which was originally here uh, normal. You can see the nerve is firing uh, excessively. That began from the C fiber that was firing uh, abnormally. 
So there is abnormal propagation of uh, discharges, which include the normal nerve. You see the C fiber or the peripheral nerve was uh, damaged, but after the ganglion or after firing the spinal cord, it was all normal. But the normal fibers will continue to propagate these abnormal discharges, which explains why those patients have exaggerated uh, responses to even normal uh, stimuli. This is another more uh, elaborate uh, figure. This is the descending pathway. Basically, we have some nuclei in the brainstem which inhibit the pain. Those are descending to the spinal cord. They inhibit the pain. And we have the upgoing pathway, which is from the periphery, which we just uh, explored. You see here the locus ceruleus produces norepinephrine. And we will see that uh, some other neurotransmitters have an uh, important role as well. So what are the people that are affected by um, neuropathic pain? Actually, neuropathic pain was, is very common. There is uh, some review that uh, screened the general population for neuropathic pain. And it was found that up to 10% of uh, people have uh, neuropathic pain. That is the general population. Population That, of course, has many uh, factors and can differ from population to population. Uh, diabetes patients have what's called painful uh, diabetic nephropa, uh, neuropathy, sorry, which can occur in up to more than half of the patients. And they don't, also, don't only have this kind of pain, they can have other neuropathic pain uh, which can go goes up to 100% of type 1, 2 diabetes in some studies. So diabetes have to deal with a lot of neuropathic pain. Uh, we know well that herpes zoster uh, infection or its reactivation causes post-herpetic neurologia and the prevalence at one year after the uh, incidence of uh, have resistor reactivation, about 6% have uh, neuropathic pain or post-herpetic post neurology. Post-stroke, we have 5 to 10% of uh, central uh, neuropathic pain. Multiple sclerosis patients also have uh, neuropathic pain. Parkinson's disease, up to 5%, 15%, sorry, can have neuropathic pain. There are um, other conditions, uh, and those include, most importantly, cancer patients, trigeminal neurology, post-traumatic neuropathic pain, phantom limb syndrome, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, failed back surgery syndrome, and peripheral neuropathies. Um, I think we all are uh, familiar with those, but I will explain a bit the complex regional pain syndrome. They tend to have a history of a limb injury, for example, and they may have underwent some surgery to uh, fix it, but they, they continue to have chronic pain and it is really debilitating. And some interesting features that is that some patients may just wish to cut their limb off, for example, their hand or their uh, arm, just to get rid of the pain. And no clear cause can be found, but it is hypothesized that there is some uh, hyperactivity in the sympathetic uh, nervous system. This is a beautiful uh, figure or illustration. Uh, for different causes of neuropathic pain and the distribution of pain. So here we know the classical facial pain in the trigeminal neurology, post herpetic neurology, which has the dermatomal uh, distribution. We have peripheral nerve injury pain, which depends on the uh, individual nerves that are involved. We have uh, post uh, amputation pain, transverse syndrome. And the painful polyneuropathy, which is associated with diabetes, 
the, that exist in the distribution of clubs and stocks. Then we have the vinculopathy involving uh, specific dermatomes. Then we have the uh, spinal cord injury. Uh, it can involve a single uh, segment or the whole body below a certain segment or different distributions. Post stroke pain uh, occurs in the contralateral side, as we all know. Um, then MS patients tend to have a combined pattern between what's, uh, what exists in stroke patients and spinal cord injury patients. Okay, how do we diagnose that a patient has neuropathic pain, that is pain due, uh, due to nerve injury? So the presentation can actually be uh, both in positive and negative uh, symptoms. Positive symptoms can include tingling, stabbing pains, burning pains, as well as cold pains and electric shock sensations. Negative uh, phenomena can include numbness, deadness of uh, certain uh, uh, limbs, or feeling like you're wearing uh, socks and gloves all the time, or feeling that one's limb is not a part of their body in terms of sensory perception. Now, of course, we'll do examination. We, will, we should do a full sensory examination, including pinprick sensation, light touch, temperature, vibration, and proprioception or sense of position. We have uh, some few um, scales that can detect the probability of having, uh, having neuropathic pain. We also have quantitative sensory testing that can augment the neurological exam by uh, certain, um, certain degrees of temperature or other sensory stimuli and then grading the response. Uh, of course, we have neurophysiology, nerve conduction studies, and electromyograms, evoked potentials, which involve, the, involve uh, sending some signals along the sensory pathways and uh, detecting how long they take to reach the spinal cord or the brain. Skin biopsies, lastly, can show us the actual damaged nerve fibers. All right, so, so this is one of the scales used. It is relatively new. It is uh, obviously developed by some uh, brilliant French uh, researchers. Uh, it is known as the uh, pain, neuropathic pain in four questions, or as Google taught me, douleur neuropathique en quatre questions. So it involves 10 uh, items. Three items uh, can be done by examination, and seven items can be done in, uh, by history. And the history items can be self-reported. Uh, it has a cutoff of four points, and it has a quite high sensitivity and specificity at uh, this cutoff. And uh, it involves some item or uh, symptoms we uh, already talked about, uh, like the quality of pain as tingling, pins and needles, itching, and uh, the presence of some sensory abnormalities on examination. So this is a uh, like a recap uh, published by Nature Reviews for diagnosing, diagnosing neuropathic pain. You begin by history, you determine if, if it makes sense in uh, neuroanatomy, and you do the examination if it is consistent, then you do the uh, diagnostic studies we just talked about. All right, let's go to treatment now. Medications. There is a general uh, rule of thumb for these medications. We have to start low and go slow. And we should uh, obtain an ECG at baseline for starting the medications because they can have they can cause some conduction problems. 
the tricyclic antidepressants, including amitriptyline and nortriptyline, in smaller doses than used in uh, depression. And we have the uh, gabapentinoids or the or gabapentin and pregabalin, uh, which work not by GABA actually, but by calcium channel uh, blockage. Uh, now we have to take care while prescribing uh, these medications because they can produce a risk of uh, suicidal thoughts and behavioral change, especially in the elder, elderly. So they have to be used with caution. Uh, some other medications uh, like serotonin and norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors, including duloxetine, which is famously used in uh, diabetic neuropathy, and the lafaxine. They are uh, beneficial in depression and anxiety, which are pretty common with the uh, neuropathic pain. We have some topical uh, treatments like the 5% lidocaine, it can be used as a patch or a gel, it works by sodium channel blockage, and capsaicin, which exists in the patch form and the cream form, and it works by desensitization, it was theorized, but it has some potential of denervation of the area that is uh, that it is applied to, and it can have a uh, induce a burning sensation uh, an application. It is very useful in peripheral neuropathy. Finally, or not finally, but importantly, opioids. Uh, it is agreed upon that they are not the first line, except in cancer patients, and they are used only in acute conditions. Okay? So perhaps the most famous one, tramadol, uh, which can be used from 50 to 100, uh, four times a day. The max is 300 in uh, elderly patients about 75 a day. It works by, uh, just like tricyclic antidepressants, by uh, inhibiting uh, norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake. So it can uh, um, precip precipitate the serotonin syndrome, and it lowers the threshold for seizures. So it can produce seizures in patients uh, susceptible to seizures. The American Academy of Neurology actually uh, put uh, some considerations when uh, dealing with patients or prescribing opioids in neuropathic pain. As we said, they are not the first line in the long term. And if they're prescribed, they should be part of the of a multidisciplinary program. So you have a psychotherapist, a physiotherapist in uh, physical injuries, and uh, psychiatrists, as well as pain uh, specialists. And if we uh, prescribe immediate release forms, uh, they should be started at the lowest dose possible. And after prescribing uh, opioids, there should be monitoring the patient for the need of, of these opioids. If the pain is controlled, there's no need for more uh, opioids, they can be tapered down. Especially in the first uh, one to four weeks, then at least every three months. Um, also, in every visit, there should be a screening for function and uh, substance abuse and if the patient reaches 80 to 120 uh, milligram of morphine equivalent doses a pain management specialist uh, must be consulted and it is a great practice that all uh, opioids are uh, controlled by a single authority that can oversee all prescriptions of uh, opioids. Uh, what about uh, cannabinoids? Marijuana, weed, cannabis. Uh, the, is, the evidence is inconsistent, but 
uh, it is used. And for example, the Canadian Pain Society considers cannabinoids as a third line in narcotic pain. But uh, care should be taken in heart disease, seizures, and psychiatric disorders. So although there are some uh, potential benefits, if there is any heart disease or uh, pre-existing seizure disorders, psychiatric disorders, um, they should not be used or used with caution. Some other therapies that have inconsistent evidence are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and other uh, anti-seizure medications like clonitrogen, lapazamide, zanesamide, dupermate, and phenytoin. But we know that carbamazepine is the first line for some of the uh, neuropathic pain, uh, which is the uh, trigeminal neurology poison. What about the future? Uh, there are some uh, potential medications to be produced, uh, including selective uh, sodium antagonists and angiotensin two blockers and stem cell therapy. They show uh, good promise and we can hear some great news in the future for them. Okay, this is a, a quick recap for medications. Uh, we see here the descending pathways. You can see that TCAs or tricyclic antidepressants and SNRIs, as well as opioids, work on, uh, centrally in the midbrain and other areas, including the spinal cord. And the Peripheral therapies like lidocaine and capsaicin work peripherally and they're preferred in uh, uh, peripheral uh, disorders. And we have carbamazepine, as I just said. NMDA blockers uh, work uh, in uh, both pathways, as you can see here in another diagram. Uh, it is an NMDA. Uh, receptor block, block, block. Okay, do we have other therapies? Yes, we have uh, local injections. They, uh, they can be steroids or uh, local anesthetic agents blocking the nerves. It can be used in post hepatic neurology where we have a, a pain in a single distribution of a, a certain dermatome. We have nerve decompression like in trigeminal neurology we can have stereotactic, stereotactic uh, neurosurgery and deep brain stimulation as well in trigeminal neurology and central neuropathies. Deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, intrathecal injections, uh, which are injections in the subarachnoid space, but it's uh, intrathecal, uh, like a lumbopuction will get included in the application. Uh, they can help central neuropathic pains and complex uh, regional nerve syndrome. We also have epidural injections, dorsal uh, root ganglia, ganglia and peripheral nerve stimulation, like if we have a disease in a single distribution or uh, in felt back surgery syndrome, so one patient has or had some problem in his back, like this prolapse, and they did the surgery, but they still have the pains so these methods can be used. Uh, and actually spinal cord stimulation is FDA approved uh, for um, felt back surgery syndrome. And it, it is shown that it is better than doing the surgery again. Uh, sympathetic to me, original sympathetic nerve block. So therapy that is uh, directed at the sympathetic uh, nerves can help complex regional pain syndrome because, as we said, there's a possibility of uh, sympathetic uh, nerve pathology. Uh, we have magnetic stimulation, which can be uh, delivered epidurally or transcranially. And they, of course, they um, help the central modulation of pain. Non-pharmacologic treatment. These focus basically on uh, function and quality of life. Of course, they include physiotherapy, 
because as we see the uh, certain um, spasticity or contractures can exacerbate the pain and physiotherapy is an essential part of um, treating neuropathic pain. One great example is aquatic therapy, which allows movement and rehabilitation in a smooth environment. Occupational therapy should be uh, used so to make the working environment for the patient more uh, adapting to his injury. Acupuncture has some positive evidence, but uh, the uh, degree of helping the patient is not well established. Last but not least, psychotherapy is an essential part of uh, treatment because uh, depression and anxiety are very common in the pain, and they can help the patient in changing their perception of the pain and focusing on uh, the goal uh, in, their, in their treatment. This is a, a recap for all the treatment. I want to focus on two points. First, you can see, uh, first of all, this is a great review uh, published in uh, Pain Medicine in 2019. If the patient has any mood or sleep disorder or decreased quality of life or any functional disability, that is caused by their neuropathic pain, they should be, from the beginning, put into a multidisciplinary care team that includes rehabilitation, psychology, lifestyle modification. So uh, if the patient is disabled and we can tell that the pain is really uh, affecting the patient's life, we should early on uh, start to engage other aspects of treatment, not to mention education. And the second point is that opioids, uh, apart from tramadol, opioids are considered here the fifth line. So we have many steps before them, and each step should be tried for at least four to six weeks. Some medications need up to uh, eight weeks or 12 weeks. So after uh, all these trials, and even neuromodulation is um, considered a fourth line of therapy, then we can start opioids. Okay. Lastly, prevention. Can we prevent neuropathic pain? Yes. We see that the majority of neuropathic pain uh, that is not traumatic um, are caused by uh, specific disorders like herpes zoster uh, um, virus infection or reactivation. So when patients are at risk, they can have the vaccine. So it can be recommended in, in patients that are immunocompromised and those above 50, 50 years of age. And also if there is infection, prompt treatment will reduce the, the pain. Uh, back surgeries, uh, perioperative management, the positioning, rehabilitation, uh, all this can prevent neuropathic pain uh, in back surgeries. Better control of chronic diseases like diabetes and mellitus will actually prevent the, uh, the neuropathic pain because a painful diabetic neuropathy is produced by nerve injury by toxicity of glucose. Healthy lifestyles, of course, uh, avoiding trauma, uh, for sure, and promoting uh, healthy lifestyles to prevent chronic diseases is considered a part of prevention of neuropathic pain. At the end, it was a great pleasure for me, and I thank you for this opportunity to present uh, in front of you. Um, all the best to open. Thank you. A wonderful presentation, a very comprehensive presentation. I uh, really appreciated it. Um, Thank you. Uh, okay, any questions? Or... Did you come across still a ganglion blockade? 
Sorry? Spellate ganglion blockade. It seems to be a special, uh, a new, seems to be helpful. I've read about that. Um, both for post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as for neuropathic pain. Interesting, interesting. I think the point you made is how ideal and how complicated it may be impossible to provide the whole uh, uh, complete treatment for people uh, with uh, chronic pain syndromes. I mean, I think just watching in Dr. Bernard's office, the small amount that he can offer a patient, uh, it, uh, it takes a whole team, as you say, and where do you find these, this team? That's true, but I think I think uh, family physicians should be uh, central to all this process, so they ha can help the coordination between different parts. Right. No, it's not. I, my, sorry, sorry. I have here an article from Practical Pain Management. Uh, it's a, a meta-analysis of 200 trials from 2008. 0.43% mm, of patients in the treatment group experienced suicidal ideation or behavior compared to 0.24% of the placebo patients. So, so what was the first percentage? 0.43 in treatment and 0.24 in placebo. So the absolute risk increase is very low, 0.19%, but the, but the relative risk increase is a little higher. It's, it's almost double, double the risk, yeah, yeah. twice. Um, I found another review from 2019. They say that of all patients that were treated by gabapentinoids, 5%, 5.2% uh, were treated for suicidal behavior or 